Well, good morning, Twin Rivers. It's so good to see you today. And I have the honor of being able to speak to you today. I always uh, love the chance to come up here and be with you. And uh, you look good for holiday weekend. You guys look good. Are you you're ready to have a good time this week? I hope you are. Um, uh, so we're going to spend a few minutes uh, talking about something I think is really, really close to my heart. I'm Pastor Rob. If you don't know me, I'm the executive pastor. And if you're opening your Bibles today, you can open up to the story we're going to get to in just a few minutes in Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3. And um, today we're going to talk about uh, something that I feel like we don't talk enough about in the church because a lot of times it's assumed that we do this. But I will tell you that I found more times than not the reason we don't talk about it is because we don't do it very often. And that is um, really the concept of evangelism. I'm calling this tell the story today. Um, and uh, we know that the Bible uses the term the gospel to be the story of Jesus. And that term actually means good news. Now, everybody likes to tell good news, don't you? Uh, come on, wave at me if you do. You like to tell good news. Uh, I know you do because I'm on Facebook with a lot of you, and I see whenever you have good news, you share it. I mean, if you get a promotion at work, you don't sit on that information, do you? I mean, you usually pick up the phone and call somebody or tell them about it. Or if you get engaged, I've seen you on social media, you know, you blast pictures everywhere. And, um, you know, or if you're going to have a baby, that's a big one. Everybody wants to share that good news all the time. And don't get me started if you have a gender reveal party, okay? Because that is plastered all over the internet, the videos and everything. And for good reason, right? Because it's good news. And we like to share good news. Matter of fact, no matter who you are, good news is always exciting. But this reminds me of my children. I want to talk about my kids for just a moment. Many of you know that I have four kids. Jen and I have four kids, and all of them are very different. They all have their own unique personality, and uh, that's how kids are. You know, they're made that way. And, uh, but we have one little guy who stands out a lot of times as our social guy, okay? It's Joshua. He's five years old. He's extremely outgoing. I have no idea where he got his personality from, but I'll tell you what, he goes with it without, without shame. And the other three are, uh, you know, kind of shy around people they don't know. But Joshua, to meet a new person is exciting to him, okay? It is, it is a thrill of his life. So last summer we were on vacation, and Joshua uh, looks at going to a hotel as an opportunity to meet new people. And so he takes that opportunity, and we were all kind of traveling up to our room from the pool. You know how that is, right? You just want to get to the room and get changed. You're soaking wet. We had our towels around us. But uh, when the doors opened a couple floors below our room and a senior couple walked on, that was Joshua's chance to meet a new person, okay? So the rest of us are cowering in our towels, and Joshua just steps forward as they walk on with no warning and says, hey, I'm Joshua. This is the Devaney family. We're from St. Louis and we're on vacation. Who are you? We have really high hopes for him. Okay. He, uh, you know, so stunned, they kind of stood there for a moment because he's this tall and uh, they just said, told us who they were, you know, and we made a new friend that day because Joshua is very easy for Joshua to tell the story of his life. Now, um, for some of you, that may come easy, but for some of you, it may come hard. Why? Because a lot of times our story involves pain or struggle. Our story, even the story of Jesus saving us, the redemption that he has done for us, the miracle of changing us, uh, comes with a lot of baggage at times. And to talk about it is difficult. Matter of fact, I believe that even if you're an outgoing person, it can be difficult or overwhelming to tell the story of Jesus. Did you know that the enemy has set out to keep you from telling your story? That he actually, one of his functions is to keep Christians from telling others about the good news of Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, it's a spiritual battle that the enemy fights us in because he knows that redemption stories are powerful stories. He knows that life transformation makes a huge difference in someone else's life. And so he's going to do everything he can to keep you and I from telling the story. Matter of fact, we read how powerful this is in Revelation. I just want to share that with you this morning. In Revelation chapter 12, uh, this is one of those end time God gets the victory verses. So get ready to get excited, okay? Listen to what it says in verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens. It has come at last, salvation and power, and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, that's the enemy, 
has been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before God day and night. And now help me with verse 11. Listen to this. And they have defeated him by what? The blood of the lamb and by, say this with me, their testimony, their testimony, their story. You know what's so powerful about this is that God is saying at the very end, the thing that will break the enemy from ever having influence over God's people again is by two things. One, you and I can do nothing about it. It is only by the grace of God, the blood of Jesus, that he is defeated. So that's a powerful, supernatural tool to defeat the enemy. The second thing, though, requires you and I to be engaged in it, and that is to tell our story. Your testimony has power in it to not only change someone's life, to encourage someone, but to tear down the very thing that was built against you from being effective, and that is the enemy's tools. The spiritual fight of the enemy can be destroyed by you telling your story. And I can't stress enough to you today how important it is that your story matters. You know, the truth is, is that the tale of our transformation is the message of hope that somebody has been waiting to hear. What you have overcome in your life is important to somebody else's life. Now, we may struggle with that because of what that means. You know, maybe you wrestle with your past. And, and I just want to remind you that Jesus wrestled with sin to save you. And you might struggle with your testimony and what it entails, but Jesus struggled with the cross to redeem you. And, and you and I might fear sacrificing our reputation if we tell our whole story. But Jesus sacrificed his throne to get to know you. And the most powerful tool to fight the enemy with is, and against your past is to tell your story. It's really to tell the good news, his story. I'm telling you that God intends for you and I to do this. Matter of fact, we find that this is what he called all his disciples to do before he left and went to heaven. And if you look at Matthew 28, we call it the Great Commission because it's a call, a spiritual call of Jesus to the people he was leaving right before he went to heaven. And he, he says this in verse 18. He came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is what Jesus says to the people who are waiting, watching him being taken to heaven. This is his final instructions to them. So I, I, I translate, I looked up this a little bit, and there's the word make disciples here is actually one word, and I'm going to say it wrong probably, mathetio. I said it right, two services in a row. I've said it right. That's, I'm proud of myself. Mathetio, and here's what it means, okay? It literally means to create a learner of or a student of something. So here's, here's what Jesus was saying. When I want you to go into the, all the world, I'm asking you to make disciples or create a learner of my word, to create a learner of my story, someone who is a student of what I have done and who I am. And so I was researching a little bit more, and I actually came across an article by the makers of the Jesus film. Has anybody ever heard of the Jesus film? Wave at me if you have. This is a very, if you've been in missions or evangelism, you know about the Jesus film. It's actually gone all over the world in many, many different languages and been a very powerful evangelism tool. Most of the missionaries that we have in our church have used this or have known someone who used this very effectively. And here's what the writers of that film said about this passage. They said that making disciples is an enduring long-term commitment to uncovering and discovering what it means to be devoted to Jesus. Now, that's a serious definition, okay? I mean, a, a long-term enduring commitment. But here's what they said about that. To be a disciple, the very first thing that sets you apart as a disciple, the point of entry, they said, to being a disciple is to share the good news with someone else. So what it means is that the very last thing that Jesus said before he left this earth was that you and I were to tell our story of how he had forgiven us and that we were to tell our story about what he has done in our life. Matter of fact, that's the call that you and I have. A lot of times we look at that as the call of the missionary, but it applies right here every single day where we live. Do you know we're we're not very good at it, just to be honest. Before you think I'm judging you, okay, I know I don't know all of you, but as a whole, 
We're not great at this. I mean, the very last thing that Jesus said, one of the most powerful tools to defeat the enemy, what you and I should be resting in, that it is our calling and it is available to us to defeat the enemy, we're not very good at it. So I I looked it up. George Barna Research, has anybody ever heard of that? That is a, a research group that does research in the Christian community around the world, and they're very reputable, and this is what they said. That in the Midwest... Of all Christians in the United States, we are actually the worst at sharing our faith. That the nationwide average is that born-again Christian adults at 55% of them will share their story. But in the Midwest, in Missouri and the surrounding states, only 41% of Christians share their faith with someone else. Here's what that means. If all of us are saved in this room... Six out of ten of us, right here, will have never shared the gospel, the good news, with someone else. I don't know about you, but that's shocking. The one tool that can defeat the enemy that we have power over, the one thing we can do to destroy his spiritual attacks, the one thing that Jesus said we should do as he was leaving this earth, only four out of ten of us have ever done it. Why is that? I mean, I understand. It's not easy. Like I said, it doesn't matter what your personality is. This could be overwhelming for you at times. And here's why. I think there's a lot of obstacles to keeping us from sharing our faith. The truth is, it's the fear of rejection, right? We have a good relationship with somebody. We don't want to ruin it. So we're afraid they might reject us if we bring up God or bring up Jesus. I mean, we struggle with that, don't we? Or that it feels awkward, you know? How do I even start a conversation with somebody about faith? How do I even let them know that I'm a person of faith, much less that they need it? I don't know how to do that. Or maybe it's anxiety. We struggle with this, I think, that we don't know what to say. We won't have the answers at the time that they might ask the question. We don't know what we would do with that. But sometimes I think it's because we're too busy. You know, we're just too busy. Life is too busy to get involved with somebody else. That neighbor that you see every day that's kind of cold and distant and they're really not nice and you could probably assume they don't have Jesus in their life because there's no hope or joy. But, you know, you have the answer, but you don't really have time to interrupt your life to go over there and start the conversation. You know, so you sort of just return the coldness back. I mean, I know how it is, right? These are obstacles that keep us from sharing our faith. Little things, or maybe it is, that our lives don't always match the message. Because once we share it, I mean, let's just be real, we have to live it. I mean, it's super quiet in this room, but but here's what, six out of 10 of you are going like, oh man, (laughs) right, according to research. No, I feel the same way. Because I've missed opportunities in my life and I don't share Christ the way I should and, and God is telling us to, right? It is, can we overcome these obstacles? Can we overcome the anxiety and the fear and, 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 and maybe the busyness of life? And I, and I want to tell you today, I want to encourage you this. Yes, we can. I think we can overcome it. Not only can we overcome it, I think we can be better at it. I'd love for George Barna to do research in 10 years and say, man, you know what happened? The Midwest turned around, and now it's like 9 out of 10 share their faith. I mean, you shouldn't be able to come to St. Louis and not hear about what Jesus has done. That's my prayer. So how do we overcome these obstacles? There's, there's a couple ways, I believe. Real quick, just want to give you two things that I think can help you overcome these obstacles if that's you. One, you got to change your perspective on it. It's not a, I have to share my story. It's, I get to share my story. You know the difference, right? It's not a, I have to. It's a, I get to. It's this amazing opportunity that I have to share the grace of God because I know that God loves all people. He loves them more than I ever could. He offers them love and grace that is unmatched in this world. And I've been the experiencer of that amazing grace. It's a, I get to, not a, I have to. Listen to what Peter tells us here. Peter's a great example of this. 2 Peter 3, 9, he says this. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise to return, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to. To repent. Why is Peter talking about that? Because the truth is, is that Peter was really excited when Jesus was on this earth to set up his kingdom. Matter of fact, Peter was like, 
Christ, when are you going to set up your kingdom? I mean, is it like tomorrow? Is it next week? Is it on a holiday? You know, he was believing that Jesus was going to set up his authority on earth right then. So he really, when Jesus left, was the one of the first people to say, I can't wait for him to return. And Pe but Peter comes to a realization here that God's grace is outweighing his urgency to be in charge of this earth. God's grace and his love is so great that he's actually being patient. The fact is, is that God is waiting on you and me to tell the story. He doesn't want to return yet because there's so many people who would be destroyed if he came today. So if you are as excited as I am about Christ's return, your top priority should be to tell the story of Jesus, because we hasten his return with every soul who says yes to him. It's powerful. It's a get to, not a have to. When I was in college, um, I, I got a chance to go overseas on an exchange program with a college in England, and I, and I loved that experience. It was an amazing experience, a whole semester. Uh, you know, it was so life-changing, these things that, you know, it, you can't help but talk about them. And when I came home, I was so excited about it, I was telling everybody, okay? I was telling everybody that would listen to me, that would give me a minute about the experience that I had had. And actually, during this time is when I met my wife, Jennifer. So um, we actually went on our first date during this time, and um, I, I kind of talked her ear off <laughs> about it. I, I pulled out pictures. It was, I was super cool. I just want to tell you that. And I, it's actually a miracle that I got a second date because, you know, later we, when we were married, she was able to be honest with me. And she said, I thought you were never going to shut up about that dumb scrapbook. <laughs> and um, I, I had a scrapbook, okay? I had two or three of them. They're in a bin in the basement now, so we never pull those things out. The thing is, is that my experience, I just loved it. I, it, I got to tell people about it. I, I couldn't wait to tell people about it. And if you're excited about Jesus, listen, you, it's a get to, not a have to. It's got to be the most exciting thing in your life that Jesus has changed you and redeemed you and transformed you and that you have power over sin and power over darkness and difficulty. It doesn't have to last for eternity because you have freedom in him. I mean, it's in a get to, right? Not a have to. So we need to change our perspective a little bit. The second thing is this. We're really eyewitnesses to something amazing. You know, we're, we're eyewitnesses to the grace of God, to the forgiveness of God. What, what, is, what does an eyewitness do? They say, this is what I saw, this is what I experienced, and this is what happened. The truth is, is that an eyewitness simply tells the story. An eyewitness simply tells the story. And I'm an eyewitness about what God has done in my life. I'm an eyewitness of what God can do. Pastor Josh just got up here a few moments ago, and he shared a personal story about his mission trip that he's going on to El Salvador. And, I, and I'm my, this close to my heart. Not only am I involved in missions here, but both my wife and my oldest daughter are going with him to El Salvador in a week and a half. And they're very excited about this. What he didn't tell you is that his story is not unique to just him. Matter of fact, there's 16 people going on that trip. And to a person, God has provided every single thing they need to go on that trip. Matter of fact, we're two to three weeks out and everybody's almost paid off because of God's faithfulness to deliver and, and you know what's amazing about that is that that's happened four times this year because every trip this church has taken to missions, God has come through in that way. Matter of fact, every trip that I've done in my life, and I've done missions for 21 years, God has always provided. I've never seen anybody not go because of money, because God is a faithful God. Listen, I'm an eyewitness to what God can do. Matter of fact, when I sit in front of a, peop a group of people that says, I'm not sure if I can go on a missions trip. I don't know if I can make the time. I don't know if I can raise the money. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I tell them without question, listen, if it's God's will, he will provide for you. You don't have to worry about it. Why? Because I'm an eyewitness to what God can do. So I tell everybody about it. And the truth is, is that's what we should be doing with our story. We should tell the story because we're an eyewitness to what God has done and can do somebody else's life. And you and I both know there are people around us every single day who need to hear that he can do it, that he can make it possible. Amen? All right, so today I just want to give you three points. Every good sermon has three points, and all the bad ones have two. So I made sure I came up with three um, that, I, that are practical ways to tell the story of what God has done. Number one. If you're writing this down, 
You need to pray about it. You need to pray about it. Well, Pastor Rob, I mean, I th thought you just said God already told us to do it, so what do I need to pray about? Well, you need to pray for him to help you. You need to pray for God to open the doors of opportunity for you to share your story because you, you need to pray on the way to work, on the way to school, uh, anywhere you go that God will open the opportunities. Here's what I know about God. God always creates a moment for his message. It's in his power to do it and he always wants to do it. You just need to pray that you guys will be on the same page, that me and God, we can do this together. While you create a moment, God, I'm gonna be ready to share. He'll always open the door. 1 Peter 3.15, again with Peter here. There's a theme throughout this, by the way. This is what he says. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always help me with these two words. Be ready to explain it. Well, how, am I, how can I be ready? You pray about it. You, because prayer adds a supernatural element to your story. Prayer adds the God's ability to your testimony. God... Allowing God to use you, relying on his help, is a supernatural thing you need to make that story impactful in someone's life. So you pray about it. You get on your knees and you ask God to help you, to open doors of opportunity, to speak through you, to say the things that you don't know if you can say, but you can trust him to say it because he is a faithful, faithful God. And so you ask him to help you. I'm going to tell you my favorite scripture verse today. This is fast becoming uh, the, the testimony of my life because I need his help in everything that I do. You know, I, I found the, the more I serve God, the more I need God. And so I pray this prayer. It's found in Colossians 1, 28 and 29. And listen to this. So we tell others about Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all the wisdom that God has given us. So you don't have to come up with it on your own. This is his ability here. And listen to what he says at the end. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. Christ's mighty power that works within me. Here's the truth. Prayer passes the power from you to God. Prayer makes it possible to preach the message. Listen, if you're wondering how he's going to come through, how it's going to happen, if you're looking for an opportunity and you don't know what you're going to do with it, you need to pray about it because prayer takes the power out of your hands and gives it to God. Amen? Here's the second thing. You've got to look for the opportunities. Look for opportunities to show up. It's not that God doesn't have people who need the story. It's not that God doesn't want to give you that chance. It's just most of the time it's that we're not looking for it. I mean, you've heard the stories, right? The miracle stories of somebody who was pumping gas at the gas station and they got in a conversation with a person next to him who was in need and right there at the gas pump, they led him to Jesus, right? You've heard those miraculous stories when somebody prayed with somebody in the Walmart parking lot. Yes, God still moves at, at Walmart, you know? You, you don't have to be somewhere else. And, uh, and God does a miracle right in their life. You've heard those stories. And it's not that God doesn't want you and I to experience that. Most of the time, it's because we're just too distracted to see them. We just don't look up very often from our daily schedule. And I get it. I mean, I, you know, Jen and I, we run our kids everywhere, all over the country, you know, all over the world, it feels like, for everything. We, there's always an errand to run, right? There's always something to do. There's always a phone call to take, an email to send back, a store to stop by, a job around the house. I mean, if you take a nap, you feel guilty, right? We're busy, but we're not too busy to lift our eyes and look for an opportunity. The fact is, we don't look very often. 1 Peter 3.15, we just read it, but I want to focus on another word. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready. Always. You know what always means? Always. Always pretty clear. Because at any moment, God could provide you with the opportunity to tell the story of Jesus. Matter of fact, all throughout scripture, these opportunities pop up without warning. They, they come up and, and they happen and people have to be ready. And so we have to look for these opportunities. We start the day and we pray about them and then we look for them, open our eyes. And this is what happens in Acts chapter three. I asked you to turn there a moment ago. If you will, let's get ready. I want to talk to you about this story because it involves Peter again. And Peter and John 
or some of the closest disciples of Jesus. But in Acts chapter 3, Jesus has already left. It's the first century church. It's after the day of Pentecost. The power of the Holy Spirit is already in these guys' lives. Peter's already stood up and preached the first message where over 3,000 people got saved in Acts chapter 2. So in chapter 3, they're walking to the, the place to pray. They're going to the place to pray, the temple, and it was sort of a task they did every single day. And as they're walking by, there's a lame beggar on the side of the road by the temple. And he reaches out to them and he asks them for money. And let's pick up the story in Acts chapter 3, verse 6. And this is what Peter says. I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Now, now you've probably heard this message before. You know, Peter says it with such conviction. But listen, he actually preaches an entire message in two sentences here. And if I preached just two sentences, you guys would already be eating lunch, okay? But, you know, I'm still talking, so stay. All right. Um, but this is what he says in two sentences, okay? He says, money isn't your need. Man sitting there on the edge of the road, money isn't what you need. You need what I found. You need what I found. And Jesus is his name. And he wants to heal you permanently, not just get you through today. He wants to heal you permanently. Listen, that's an amazing message in two sentences. But here's where it all starts. Peter basically says to him, I'm going to give you what I have. He tells his story. He tells his story. And here's what happens. This miracle is done in the beggar's life. He stands up. He's completely healed in front of a crowd of people. Now that is a God opportunity. Peter was walking on the way to doing something normal, and God provided an opportunity right in front of a crowd of people to do a miracle. So here's what Peter did. And we should take a lesson from Peter. Peter saw this opportunity, verse 12. Peter saw this opportunity and addressed the crowd. People of Israel, he said, what is so surprising about this? And why stare at us as though we have made this man walk on our own power or godliness? And then jump down to verse 16. Listen to what he says. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name, name has healed him right before your very eyes. Peter jumps on this opportunity to share the truth. Not only did he tell his story, but he told the story of Jesus. Do you know that opportunities exist like that in your life every single day? So many times we miss them, but they sound like this. Hey, I noticed there's something different about you. How come you never use bad language at work? For some of you, you haven't heard that, but for, you know. <laughs> how come you don't use bad language at work? Why is that? Or how, you guys, your family, you're so involved in church. Why, why is church so important to you? That's an opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus. That's what it sounds like. Well, when somebody says, why are you so positive? Why are you not so negative? Everything in life is difficult, but you're so positive. Why is that? That's a God opportunity. I, or how about I've noticed you never lose your temper. Everybody else loses their temper, but you keep your cool. What is that? Do you do yoga? Do you juice on a regular basis? I'm just going to ask you these questions. That is a God opportunity. Look for it. To say, I encourage you to say this, everything I have, I owe to God. He's done everything that I need him to do. I don't need anything but him. He's the most important person in my life. That's the moment. That's the time when you should be ready to share. A friend called me recently and told me, this story at work that um, in, in a two weeks period of time, two very key people just up and quit their job. This up and quit, and he runs a team where he's responsible for these people to, uh, you know, and so he didn't have people to do the job. He has to do it, and it was extremely stressful. He had, was doing, for over a month, he was doing two, three people's jobs, moving things around, trying to hire. It was this very, very stressful situation. But right in the midst of it, his boss came up to him, his general manager of the company came up to him and said, hey, I noticed something about you. How come you don't let this get you down? How come you handle it so well? 
And very simply, this, this man said, I rely on God for everything. I could not do it without him. He's helped me these last few weeks. You wouldn't believe how stressful it's been, but he's helped me get through it. And that one statement about his story opened up a dialogue with this boss that he never gets to socialize with, it opened up a 35-minute conversation about what it means to live in faith. Now, his boss didn't get safe, but we're believing that that was the seed planted to change that man's life. Look for the opportunity. They exist. We don't think they exist, but look for the opportunity. When they start asking you how to do it, tell them it was all God that did it in you. Here's the third thing, final thing. Go for it. Go for it. That's very, very spiritual, isn't it? Go for it. Peter had uh, encountered this lame man sitting on the side of the road, and he offers him healing and salvation instead of money. Peter says at this point to the crowd, this is Jesus that's done this. He's healed this man right in front of your eyes. And with a captive audience, we find in verse 19, Peter goes for it. This is what he says. Now repent of your sins and turn to God so your sins can be wiped away. Wow. I mean, he didn't really mince any words, did he? He just, you know what? We would have said, you know, this man's been healed. Now you should come to my church. Here's the website, right? We would have said, or, hey, we're having an Easter egg hunt. or we're, You know, we would have invited them to something. But Peter just goes for it. I mean, a captive audience, he's already seen God work. He is not afraid of how his message is going to land. He simply tells people the truth. And so here's my encouragement to you today. Stop being afraid of it and go for it. Go for it with confidence because you know that it's God's will that you share the truth. Go for it with confidence so, because you know that God is going to meet you right there. Go for it. To close today, I, really, I need to tell you a personal story that I haven't shared with many people. And the, the truth is, I, I tell a lot of stories. But I haven't shared this one. But I feel like it's important for you to hear it because I think God is asking somebody to go for it today. When I was 16, I worked at a hardware store, and um, we, did, we had a lumber yard, and we, had, we sold appliances and all that. It was like Lowe's, but smaller. And a lot of, it was a good job. A lot of high school students worked there. I worked with a lot of people I knew. And uh, this one night, um, it was kind of summer like it is today. It was sort of, you know, everybody's doing other things. There was just two of us on the job. And because there was just two of us, we worked together all night long. We carried washers and dryers down and lumber and cut chain and did all the things you do at a hardware store. And this other kid's name was Jason. I had worked with Jason before, but I didn't know him very well. But we had a blast. We just had a great time. It was one of those nights, it was very slow in the store, and we just had a great time talking together. And about 10 o'clock, we locked up the store, and we went home. And the next morning, I came into work, and I was told that an hour after I saw Jason, an hour after we locked the doors of that store, just one hour after we had had one of the greatest times together, fun, great night, just one hour after we had flirted with the girls at the ice cream store that were closing up across the street, just one hour after we had gotten our cars parked next to each other in the parking lot and went home, Jason took his own life. I was the last person to see him alive. I was the last person to talk to him. His parents weren't even up when he got home. An hour later, he took his life. What's crazy about that is, is I'd worked with Jason many, many times and never felt the urgency to tell him my story. And my story wasn't a secret. By 16, I already knew that I was going to be a pastor. God had already, I'd already said yes to God. Most people I knew called me Pastor Rob. I mean, it, at that early in my life. But Jason didn't know my story. And that night, all night long, as we worked together for those five hours, I felt the Holy Spirit urging me to tell him my story. I felt the Holy Spirit telling me to talk about the good news that I knew. See, I knew Jason didn't know God. But all night long, I brushed it off. I pushed it aside. I didn't take it for whatever reason, the opportunity that God put in front of me. I didn't take it. And Jason lost his life. 
And I can tell you that I struggled so hard with that for many years. I struggled very hard because I knew that I missed an opportunity. And I committed to myself that I was never going to miss an opportunity again. Now, I don't know it, what I ha- would have said that would have changed anything in Jason's life, but I can tell you this. I believe with my whole heart that when you tell the story of Jesus, it always makes a difference. And I know that, amen, come on, give him praise. It always makes a difference. Do you know why it was so powerful that Peter did this? Do you know why he went for it? Because he had missed opportunities before. Peter was the one at the night of the crucifixion of Jesus who said, I never knew him. He was the one who said three times, I don't know what you're talking about when they identified him with Jesus Christ. Peter was the one that when the sun came up that morning, wept and cried over the missed opportunity to connect himself to the God who had just given his life for him. And he determined in his heart he wasn't going to miss another opportunity. Let me save some of you the heartache and tell you to go for it because it's not worth your reputation or your fear or your anxiety or anything to miss an opportunity to tell somebody about the love and grace of Jesus Christ. I want to tell you this morning, you need to pray about it. You need to look for the opportunities because they're going to come. And when they do, go for it because he will always meet you right there and make the difference in somebody else's life. Amen? Amen. It's not too late. I should have talked to my neighbor yesterday. I should have said that to them when they were over the house. I should have taken the opportunity. It's not too late. Jesus said this in John 9, 4. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned to us by the one who sent us because night is coming and then no one can work. But today is still daytime. And if you tell your story, you can bet that God will change somebody else's life the way he changed yours.